Thanks for staying with us. Technology is booming and it touches all aspects of our lives. Almost everyone uses technology to create the most effective and user-friendly technology. We need diversity in thought, perspective and skills. Women and men often bring different strengths to the table, which means that if women are not represented, neither are their strengths or insights. The representation of women in tech is gaining momentum. However, we still have a long way to go. For instance, women in, Nigeria, in the Nigerian tech space make up just about 22% of the workforce. Reasons for this include lack of accessible opportunities, cultural stereotypes, society's male suitability for tech roles, etc. So today we're asking, how do we start to empower women in tech? Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818-038-4663 or tweet at us at WayShowAfrica with the hashtag WayShow. So, mm. Diola, I know we, we talked fairly recently. I can't remember what we were talking about. And you yeah. talked about your experience in, in tech. Yeah. Um, that was around a recruitment exercise, I believe. Yes. But what has your experience in tech as a whole, what has that been like? Well, okay, so now I'm not in tech anymore. Mm -hmm. Back then. Uh, <laughs> so um, I still think that um, it's still very stereotyped, really. And um, you, as a woman, you're made to feel like you can go the long haul, you know, when you're in that space, you know. Uh, sometimes it's, it's unconsciously derogatory, like, you know, they make it look like, oh, they're running, they're, they're doing a marathon on coding and stuff, or oh, you have to deal with monthly stuff, you, you know, the typical yeah, stuff. The and typical the truth is, it depends on the part of tech you're in. If you're into coding, that takes quite a whole lot of time. Mm. I was into coding and, mm. you know, that's, um, you can go days, you know, trying to debug or, yeah. you know, whatever and all that. And I think that takes its toll on women. But again, I mean, um, women are much more um, interested in tech now because um, some of the things that um, society, you know, made the norm, I mean, like 10 years ago mm. and all that, gradually people are saying, okay, you know what? I think I, ha I know what I want. I think I don't really have to get married when I'm 25. Yeah, yeah. I don't really I have, have to wait. Exactly, yeah. I have options. So those things are also, you know, impacting positively, mm. you know, to having more women in the tech space who can actually go the long haul. Awesome. Yeah. Glad to see there's some progress. Now. Yeah. Hello, Mary. How are you doing today? I'm okay. I'm good. How's your week been? Come see, come see. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Yeah, um, here. Excellent. What are your thoughts on women in tech? Um, to be honest, I feel like it's not easy and I feel like it's still relatable to women in business, um, which is still tough because women have the, you have to learn to balance work life and, you know, that's a bit tough for us. We have the, when you are pregnant, that takes a toll, you know, but I can see that organizations are now stepping up to say, oh, hey, the whole work from home has changed a lot of things. Tech is making things easier in which you can, you know, stay at home and do your work. You have people who, they just gave birth and, you know, they're still on the computer mm -hmm. and they can still do it. So I think organizations are stepping up now to, include women in the workforce mm. but i i think we have a long way to go but we're doing better trust yeah. me yeah I, I think that I, I agree with you mm. there from a I see a lot more organizations being very deliberate about yeah. diversity, equity, and inclusion mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. and, you know, really making um, workplaces conducive for all types of women at all yeah. stages in yeah. their lives, yeah. really. Um, whether you're a nursing mother, whether, you know, you're, you're pregnant. I've just seen some really, really interesting um, benefits that companies... Mm -hmm. In fact, I think there was a company, uh, I think it was late last year, who was on social media talking about their benefits for fathers. So they yes. could support yeah. the yeah. mothers. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Definitely uh, important for us to stress that gains have been made, um, mm. but we won't stop here. More certainly needs to be done. Mm. We're looking forward to talking to our guest today to give us her perspective on um, women in tech. So Jane Egerton Adair is a tech executive, author and speaker. She was the head of sales Middle East and Africa for Meta, Facebook. Prior to that, she was country manager in Nigeria and the regional si sales director for the West Africa branch of Avanti Communications Group, PLC. She cumulatively, cumulatively spent 13 years in sales and management in the 
telecommunication infrastructure giant Ericsson. She also worked as a cluster lead for Nokia Siemens Network in West Africa. Being one of the few females heading key business areas in the tech industry has exposed Jane to numerous professional and personal challenges peculiar to women. Spurred by discussions with fellow female executives around the globe, she organized a forum at Ericsson in which emerging and experienced female leaders could support each other in developing their careers. The overwhelming success of the forum led her to found Women and Career at www.womenandcareer.com to reach women beyond her organization and to support girls seeking careers after school. Thank you for joining us, Jane. She joins us via Zoom. Hi, Jane. Hi, and it's good to be here. Good yes. to be back. Lovely to have you. Yes, um, you know, it's been a few years, but we always, always love to have our guests come back to the show and see how much progress you've made. I think at the time we had you on the show, the last time you were just about to go to Meta. Yes. Yes, and Absolutely. I just published my book. You did, you did. A very good read, I must add. So um, what are your thoughts so far on how the journey and the experience has progressed for women in tech? Yeah, because I was listening to Mary and um, the other lady like, share their thoughts, and I thought, wow, that's interesting, because it's been two decades. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> it's been two decades since I started my journey in tech, and it has really evolved. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the problem is entirely solved, and I don't think they'll be entirely solved in my lifetime, but I could share my perspective in terms of how I've seen progress. So I would borrow Charles Blow's uh, Analogy. He used it for a race, but it really works with the challenges women have faced in tech. It's been one of a mountain where you're trying to climb the mountain. So most of the women are, you know, faced with these hurdles to climb the mountain in their career as entrepreneurs in the society. Then it's also the challenge of trying to reduce the mountain that these women are trying to, and that's where we need more, like you know, like maybe leadership or policy makers to help reduce some of these hurdles or barriers we've created for them. Mm. But if I look at my journey so far, I'll look at it from three points. I know in, earlier in my career, we always used to say we had a pipeline challenge. So we had very few people that were coming to tech that are women. So the challenge was how do we get more girls to mm. study tech? How do we get more women into tech roles? Uh, but the reality is that we found that even though that problem is not entirely solved, we had another issue. You know, we had even the little ones that make it into tech, we had a retention problem. Like I saw that oh. firsthand. Oh. By the time I got married, I started having kids. Like all the women around me were just disappearing. Oh. Like this one is resigning. She's no longer working. She wants to be a teacher. And I'm not saying those professions are bad, but it was almost like the system had made it difficult for them to remain. It was difficult to be married as a woman and take some of those tech roles. So they start to, you know, wither away. Then we had the problem of leadership. So you now start getting close and you realize that there are very few people that look like you at those tables. And it has a huge impact because those tables, leadership tables, is where real decision is made. And if you don't influence it from the leadership, Sometimes all those goals, because I was in these companies, we're always setting ambitious targets. We want 33% of women by 20, whatever, you know. We had all these wonderful, amazing goals, but we never were really implementing them. Wow. So it's almost like it was a great and a hype thing to have a goal or a target. But when it really comes to doing the work, executing, it was lacking. And that was most times because leadership wasn't paying it. Leadership wasn't even invested to take it on as a goal and force the line management downwards to execute. So I see it from three angles. I know the broader issues are more societal related stereotypes and biases that exist. Um, that's why I said it doesn't, it's not in our lifetime we can solve that problem. But there's been some progress. Um, I, will, I will say that I know I put up a post, like uh, I think it was like a couple of months ago. I'd gone to my office in Lagos. I, I came for a meeting. I was so happy. I saw a nursing room. <laughs> and people didn't get it. I actually took a picture. I was really excited. And someone was like, why are you so excited? I'm like, when I was having kids, this didn't exist. Like I used to pump breast milk in the toilet and in the, you know, in the room where you had the file cabinets, oh. in the storeroom. 
it was it was almost like a taboo to talk about it. Yeah. And here you're proudly displaying a nursing room. Yeah. Glad like I said, we're we're all we must acknowledge the progress that we've made and we're all excited to see whatever the little gains are, we'll celebrate them and um, look forward to seeing much more. Tiana? Oh, okay, so um I she um you had mentioned something about, you know, getting women to go into STEM. You know, and um, I wanted to ask if, um, okay, I, well, I know there's a lot of advocacy going into that, but um, do you think that um, the industry in itself, you know, um, is attractive enough? I mean, considering all the challenges that um, you just mentioned, again, we have evolved, but the challenges are still there. Um, do you think that um, if there's any incentive, so to say, that um, more women, more girls who want to go into the, the STEM program and, of course, you know, bridge the, um, the degree gap, you know, between more men going into tech, you know, related um courses, profession, as against women, you know, who are just, um, well, I don't know. Just um, laid back, so to say. But um, what, what, what are the kind of incentives that you think should be put in place to ensure that um, more women, more girls, even the women in the industry currently, you know, they, are, they, are, they, they have the support, you know, that they need to, um, to foster a career advancement. Very, very good question. Very good one. I think when it comes to pipelining, one of the baseline one people had for years chased, which I think is great, is hiring, the way companies hire. We noticed if you do blind hiring, it's easy peasy. Like when you see the CV and you take away the gender, the way you would you know you would you know you would decide and choose those that make it will be different when the gender is shown. Mm. And I have personally witnessed it. I remember one role we were recruited for, and uh, it was a lady at the end. The top candidate was a lady. But when it came to the panel, you know, like debriefing, and the, we spent the whole time discussing about the fact that she was engaged and married. She's going to soon, you know, probably get pregnant, go on. Like, we were just fear mongering before the end. And I was the only woman in the panel. So it was uncomfortable, even in my little words. I'm like, you know what? Maybe we should focus on the skills. So hiring is one thing we could do when it comes to pipelining. And when it comes to retention, we could do much more, actually. Uh, because a lot has got to do with the existing leadership management. You know, the managers that hire as well. How are you creating that environment that makes it really conducive for women to stay? And uh, one easy one is the hybrid workplace. Um, didn't used to exist. You know how it is when a woman starts having kids, you know, if it's not necessary, she has to show up, you know. Like I remember you take phone calls while you're doing immunization for your kids. It was just ridiculous. Okay. If she could work remotely and still, because at the end, think about it, you were talking about coding. To write a code, I don't need to be in the office. Yeah. If you, could, if you could actually manage me based on performance, the important thing is that I delivered the code I told you I was going to deliver. Mm -hmm. You don't have to see me physically 24 hours every, you know, every weekday to do that. So things like hybrid workplaces start opening up and make it easier for women. So because most times they are at the prime of their, you know, prime of their career and still prime of their motherhood um, 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 phase when they're in those careers. And it's almost like a, you know, chicken and egg situation yeah. for them. They don't want to. Leave. Most of them don't want to leave those jobs just to have kids. They still want to relieve other parts of them. So they really want to keep the career. So if things like nursing rooms did exist, so the woman doesn't have to feel guilty pumping milk in the toilet for a baby, you know, those kind of stuff, being conducive for them that when they come back. We accommodate the fact that for a couple of months, yes, we might have to, you know, give them incentives. Like, I don't know, the closing time is being a bit more understandable. The times we have our meetings, because that was a big problem for me. Trying to um, put most of your meetings at 8 a.m. for a woman that has a toddler that is nursing, it's, it doesn't work. She probably didn't sleep the whole night. Oh, sure. She was breastfeeding, yeah. you know. So once we start to train our, so this is for retention, 
we start to make those changes to the cultural practices in our organization and how we create conducive environment for them. But we also do a bit of capacity building. You've got to train the managers because some of the biases also stem from them. The fact that the managers, the people in leadership have this unconscious bias. If the woman tells you she's going for immunization, you'd be like, immunization again? You know, like every time this baby, you know, yeah. she starts feeling uncomfortable. Next time she probably will be like, maybe I should just leave this job, you know. So those types of things would, would really help. Uh, it will really help when we create those policies within the organizations. HR has a vested interest to make sure that women, we create a conducive environment for them to remain in the organization and grow their careers if they want to. Uh, yeah. So I think that um, I, I like the fact that you've, we sort of really talked about uh, the empowerment in the workplace. Yeah. But given the numbers that we have today, um, I think that we also, when we want to try to improve the performance and improve the representation of women in tech, um, when, you, you, when you empower, you can either empower based on skill or you can empower the individual in terms of their mindset and, and how they, they approach it. So I want to talk more on that empowering the individual. Today, there's a plethora of courses that you can take in tech. Right, yeah. you can take short courses, you can still go yeah. to university. There's so many ways in which you can upskill to join the tech world. But given what you've, we've talked about so far, we can see that there's a gap in the mindset or the expectation. So when I get a job in tech, I'm excited, I'm looking forward to it. Then I'm embraced or I'm, you know, I'm faced with these kinds of, I won't call them hostile conditions, but unsuitable conditions that eventually lead to me um, is, you know, lead to me leaving as attrition, there's churn. What do you think can be done to prepare women better for roles in tech? So when I'm upskilling, are there is there like a female in tech 101 course I could take? Just just like to hear what your thoughts are there in, in preparing women better to go into tech. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that you said is there no 101. <laughs> it's just like there's no mm -hmm. manual for bothering. Exactly. But, but uh, that said, I think a lot of awareness needs to be, you know, there's a lot of awareness that is required. And I think this is where even civil societies, policy makers need to create this awareness, even down the pipeline. You don't have to wait until when they are time to go to, when it's time for them to get into the job market. Even while they are still higher education, you know, secondary school, if we create that perception that, when we are looking for people in tech, we're looking for people that can solve problems. It's not tied to the agenda or, you know, restriction is not the fact that you're, you're feminine or you're a woman. That's not a, a restriction. That is definitely a good one because mindset change takes a while. Some of these young ladies, uh, some of us young, uh, young women, it, it took a lifetime to think this way. This is subconsciously what people have nudged you to was, oh no, don't choose those courses, that's too hard. Why don't you just go and do this one and graduate? You know, so subconsciously you've been fed with all these things that wouldn't work for you in the environment you're going to now when you, you want to work. So that's one. But also even as we do that, I think organizations can do that because if, if we say civil societies and policymakers do that, a lot is also required from organizations. When we go and take these graduate hires, you know, what do we train them? And some of the training is to create the mindset of what an ideal candidate for us. And if we make it look like it's not tied to gender and these wouldn't be the challenges, you're kind of making it easier for the women to see themselves in those roles. A third thing I'll say is mentoring, I think is really good. Apart from training, if you see you do, uh, some of us took up things because we either you saw someone do it or you saw someone that you so admire taking that pathway. Then you feel empowered. You feel like, oh, I can do it. If she's because that's what has happened to me. Each of the roles that I've taken that has been so challenging because people said, oh, we never had a woman do it and you know whatever. Once I do it, if I leave that role, the next thing you see, a lot of women want to apply towards uh, towards taking on that role. So. If, if we also do that, that could be a good way, you know, like mentoring, making sure they have role models they can look up to, championing their case, you know, because sometimes also beyond mentoring, um, um, organizations should be invested in actually giving them sponsors and champions within the organization. Because sometimes also you need people that can understand where you're coming from. Um, so because if you're talking about all these mindset challenges, Tell me that your boss is a guy. He might not even understand this thing you're talking about. He doesn't get it in that sense. Not that he's being mean, but he doesn't see it from your viewpoint. There comes empathy. So a, a woman with a, a similar challenge 
or they have taken a similar journey might be able to advocate for you better and listen to your challenges. Awesome. Um, I think we should take a short break now. Um, please stay with us. We'll be right back. If you just tuned in, we're discussing the topic Empowering Women in Tech with Jane Egerton Idehe. Please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818 um, Tweet at us at Wayshow Africa One with the hashtag Wayshow, especially if you're a woman in tech. We'd love to hear your perspective on this conversation. So, um, Miri, I think we'll come to you. All right. Um, I think we've said quite a lot but which is really good. And I also like to come from the point of imposter syndrome. How do you deal with that? Because you have a lot of young females, you know, in the tech space or in the work space mm -hmm. who feel like they're not good enough while they're actually good enough. But, you know, I feel like their achievements, you're not able to advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so, would you advise more mentorship or networking? You know, what's going to help to build that firm leg where you can speak up for yourself and have a voice for yourself, you know, and believe that, okay, I'm not going to learn this thing overnight. I'm not going to be the champion overnight, but I'm on the path to being the champion. champion. Thank you, Mary. Imposter <laughs> syndrome. Everyone goes through it. I think, uh, because imposter syndrome normally kicks in where uh, there are very few people that look like you in a room. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, you start to feel very little or vulnerable, or you start to feel like your voice doesn't count. Mm -hmm. um, and it happens, you know, it could be for a woman being the only, always the only one in the room that is female, or a black person always being the only black person in the room. You know, all of a sudden, the pressure kicks in because you see very little like yourself. I know that uh, a good way, because uh, I share from my own personal experience, um, a good support system is always very helpful uh, because you're playing mind games, you're playing with your mind. Um, and it's, it really starts with sometimes people holding up the mirror for you. A, a good example, I remember I went for a program in Yale. Uh, it was a board training for women. And there were only two of us that were we, um, Africans in that large room. And, you know, I, I, was, I was, by the second day, I haven't said a single word in the room because I kept worrying about, oh, my accent, and they'd be wondering, do they understand me? Will they hear me? But the truth is that uh, one good thing that, that worked for me is one of those days I had a call to my mom, and I don't know what we we're talking about. I was like, you know what? You, you're right, though. I, I need to talk to them about Nigeria. I give them the perspective. And that changed the way I saw it. So it's to one way is to feed yourself with the fact that you bring something to the room. I think Uti was alluding to that earlier. We have to recognize the fact that you are who you are, a woman, a young girl uh, in tech. You know, there's a reason why your voice should be heard because you're speaking for many others like yourself. But it's also important to, to have a support system. Uh, because I don't think that mindset shift will kick in automatically. It's good to have people you can be vulnerable with and they can help you know, applaud you and put that mirror up and let you know that, hey, this is why you were there and this is why you should do it. Make sure you don't leave there with doing what we said you should do. So those are some of the basic things I know that have worked for me because it's also like a, a transformational thing. You're always working on it. I don't think it finally goes away. Each time where you are a minority in the room, the tendency is that, it will kick in. Mm -hmm. I always sort of talk about, um, I tell young, young people that I mentor that you should find your superpower and figure out how you're going to leverage that to your benefit. Now, one of the things that we, 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 we sort of not touched on really is the, tech, the type of products that are created in tech. So when we, we think about the products, we think about the UI UX, all of these products, when they're created, they're targeted eventually at women i mean i think i don't know this i don't have the stats on the top of my head but i would imagine that there are more female social media um, users of these platforms oh, than, yes, than, exactly. than, than, than there would be men so what impact right, right? because if we're, imp we're if we're talking about empowerment what impact from that perspective given that you're creating a product for the gender would having a higher representation of that gender um in those types of teams what impact would it have 
And that's why sometimes we get the products wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm even talking to tech. Let's just take basic AI. I was playing with an AI filter the other day. It was meant to do makeup. And it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure that some, whoever wrote that code behind the scene, was it a guy? It was a, probably was a guy. And his idea of how a woman should be made up and the colors to be used, like, probably different. So that's why it's so important we have women in those rooms. If you are targeting a, a specific market, an addressable market, and the demographics is male and female, it only makes logical sense that to create that product, there should be male and female in the room. Yeah. If not, you're creating a product for a one-sided um, demographic, you know, you're a one side, uh, for just one side of the, of the gender space. Mm -hmm. And that's why most times we get it wrong again and again. Mm -hmm. A good example, you know, just speaking to what you said, is the shoes. What? Remember the, 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 the red sole shoes that we all wear, Louis mm -hmm. Vuitton, everybody loves them. They are very fancy, they are very expensive, but they are very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I kept wondering, why is this thing so uncomfortable after all the money I've spent? Mm -hmm. Then I Googled, I found out that the creative director is a guy. He doesn't get to wear the shoe the entire day like I do. So he doesn't get the comfort part. He just wants to make it look attractive and classy. And that's what happens to the tech products. Once we're not having women in the room, especially products that are targeting women, there's always a, dis there's a misalignment. Mm. Then it takes loads and loads of iteration to get it right. And the basic way to fix it is to have the women in the room. Because mm, yeah. I remember there's a tech product we're talking about. I was just in the room for a different reason. And by the time they had told me about this, their wonderful idea, I told them the market you are serving, they were going to, the, the product was to service uh, a market, traders in the market, which were mostly women. Mm -hmm. But the people building the product did have no, they have no proper alignment to that target market. And it was creating a product in the air that the people going to use it will probably not use it. So it's so important, right? Especially now we are at this, you know, transition point where we are having AI blog. Mm -hmm. If you don't have women in those rooms helping you build those products, you're back to square one. Okay, so, um, I mean, in all of this, I, I was thinking of um, a founder's gap, you know. Um, there is, a lot of women are going into business now, mm -hmm. you know. Again, mm -hmm. we're getting the skills, we're upskilling and all of that. And funding is always a major issue. So I'm thinking, I, I, I don't know what your take on, on that would be, but I'm thinking that if we're trying to drive more women into the tech space, then we should create opportunities where women who are willing to start up their own tech businesses have access to funding. Mm. Because funding is a huge part in why, in why a lot of women would just be like, okay, you know what? Okay, I can't work in this space because things are not going the way I want them to go. You know, I, I don't have all the opportunities I want. I can't start my own stuff because I don't have the funding for it. So what do you think should be done? Or how do you think women can access funding, you know, to start um, to encourage startups, female-owned businesses, and, you know, drive the yeah, dri drive the, that empowerment, you know. Devola, you're so right, uh, because even if you look at the uh, West African space, I think women are very entrepreneurial in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I can't remember the number. It's like it's, it's more than the global average. But of course, in terms of scaling up those business funding, they struggle when it's time to raise funds. Because most of these, you know, <laughs> the investors themselves are male. People are almost drawn to people that look like them. You know, you hang out with the people that look like you. You want to, you know, you, you think like them and you think that if it's not presented in that way, you don't see it as an opportunity. It's like, oh, she has a good idea, but nah, we're looking for a, a unicorn. So one way, of course, I, I notice women have is to put our money where our mouth is yeah. and it's to have more women investors. Uh, more women funded. And you, you started to see that crop up. You see a couple of um, funds that are just targeting women, especially in the fintech. I think that's one way to do it because it's only, uh, uh, um, if you don't give those women a chance, they will never you know, blossom to give us those unicorns and those wonderful startups we want to see. Uh, but they don't stand a chance because the people allocating the funds don't look like them, don't think like them, 
and are biased towards thinking that they can't think big and create big startups like we've seen. So it's to have women actually do that. And you start to see that in terms of the angel funding. I think policy could help, actually, you know, because even when we create all this, uh, uh, the governmental programs and create funds and all that, if we give organizations, because that's what people started doing, if we give funds, incentive to make sure they fund female businesses, mm. if they know that they have an incentive, they get the tax rebate, they get, they get something, there's a leverage you're going to use, you see more of them start to deliberately look for female founded or owned businesses. Mm. And that's how we could change that. Because if you don't get, give them the incentive, they'll still do what they've always done because it's always worked for them. And then we continue to have that gap. So it has to be two point where women themselves are doing it. You know, you know, when it, when, ah, I've forgotten one slog that someone had used that when it comes to having women also invest in female owned businesses so that we can support them, but also to make sure that um, the standard funds, the standard investors are giving incentive to want to fund female owned businesses. Okay. Um, I would like to hear your view on the AI scare that is going on right now. We've heard that the founder has stepped out of the, the box. Has left the building. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and has said that there's a lot of dangers and, you know, he has just left us hanging. And I know full well that the chat G... Chat PT, GPT. Yeah, chat you know, is really, mm -hmm. you know, gaining waves these days. So, I mean, is it... Harmful? Should we be cautious of it, or I mean, are the advantages more than disadvantages? What do you have to say on that? Maybe if, if, if my my personal opinion is too late, even though he leaves the building, the thing has taken off already. You, you can't stop it, you know. It's already it's, I know. It's, it's taking a life of its own. Hmm. I like to see this. I always say that technology is like a knife in your kitchen. I like to use those that illustration. A knife in, the, in your kitchen, in your hands, is a wonderful tool. Mm. You're chopping onions, you're peeling your yam, you're cooking, you, you make a good meal. If a thief comes to your house, a knife in his hand is a very dangerous tool. That's not what you want. And that's how technology in many ways looks like. It can be used for good. And that's where policy comes in, you know. It can be used for good, but it can be used for bad. Because now we're talking about... AI and all the wonderful things it can do for us, especially with ChatGPT, open AI, and how it will transform the way we do work in the next century. You know, like even some of the jobs we do, we would it will change. Some of the knowledge work we do, the way we do it will change because we can literally outsource some of those cognitive tasks to AI. They will write your the AI will write your article, do your proposal. Yeah. <laughs> so many things that like I use it, man. I use it. I'm not not complaining. But we, we, we want to make sure that it doesn't fall into the hands of the wrong people. Because oh, what happened yeah. to social media? Yeah. Because we didn't step in with the right... Um, people didn't know what to do with this. So when it comes to privacy and all security, it was hanging in the air for a long time. Mm. Nobody could define what the rules should be. So anything went. And that's how, you know, even our kids got caught up in that whirlwind. So now that it's still early, I don't think we should, my, my opinion... Maybe it's not a time to leave it to the technocrats or the technology uh, creators themselves to police it uh, because um, it's probably not going to be the best. In most cases, they might not have an incentive to want to do it because people can actually use it for bad. Right. Think about it if someone, you know, gets one of these AI plugins and writes the model that can scrape around collecting data about people's credit card. And, you know, you can do so many crazy things with it that are not actually legal, you know, but you don't want that. But this is the time to now start sitting and saying, what, what kind of policy should we put around it? You see, you can create, we're talking about misinformation. You can create all them fake videos now because we can simulate, no matter the kind of voice you have, it can be simulated with AI. We can do the same thing with your pictures. Or we can create funny pictures, funny videos of you that you didn't even do. And it looks like a real video of you. And that could create a lot of misinformation. But maybe this is a time to regulate it and now state that, okay, if it was done with AI, it should be stated there that this video was done with AI. It's not the actual uh, maybe person or this is an AI generated video. 
I think the earlier we, we start to do that, it will reduce the harmful effects because if we don't do that, we start having a case of she said, he said, nobody's sure with all the information going around, which one is actually sourced correctly and which one is just AI generated. So this is a good time to start having the conversations. I think this is a time that policymakers should start having that conversation. How do we ensure that there's privacy and security as AI starts to evolve? Let, let's hope that in, in setting those types of policies, um, people then don't feel that um, their rights are being infringed on. But um, we've enjoyed the conversation as we come close to the end of the show. Um, I'd like you to leave us with your thoughts. And, and these thoughts are, are targeted at three different women. I'd like you to give us your final comments to a young girl today who's thinking about a job in tech, to a young lady who has just started her job in tech, and finally, to a lady who's thinking, I'm ready to leave tech. Mm. What would you say to each of them? Oh, the lady that is ready to, I'm already saying it all. <laughs> but to the, to the young lady that's just about to start tech, the world is your oyster. I think you're a human first before you're a woman. And that's what's important. Because tech is all about solving problems. Yeah. And we need you to solve problems because the problems are for both male and females. If you're not there to solve problems, there'll be nobody solving problems with women in mind. So it's so important that you take that journey because your voice, you are needed in the room. To the woman in tech already, I want to say that you probably have started climbing this hill. So you have started experiencing some of the gaps. Now, I would love to tell you that the gaps wouldn't exist, but they will be there. But what I can tell you is that the mountain has been, or the hill, has been reducing with time. If you have more people like you to speak up, call out things, that hill will keep reducing so that your daughters, your sons, would have a better experience than you did. That's why it's so important that you do it. Because if you look back 150 years, even women were not expected to go to college. They were not allowed into all these Ivy League colleges. But today, they can vote. They can go to college. So yes, the pains you have today will be the glory for your daughter tomorrow. So it's important you also hang in there. Yeah. And very quickly, for the, the girl who is about to get into, who is thinking about getting into tech. <laughs> Oh, no, leaving. Now now we're yes. stuck with the one that is leaving, isn't it? Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> oh, to the one that is leaving, I know that you are actually drained. If you're leaving, it has gotten to you. But that's life. You know, life will have its highs and lows. Uh -huh. So my only ask for you is that think about the reason you got into tech. Could that be a reason to keep you there? Uh -huh. There must have been a reason. There must have been some dream, something you were trying to achieve. Can you look for a way to recharge yourself so can you can go back to the actual reason mm. and don't let all these distractions take you away? Excellent. Thank you so much, Jane. We've certainly had a great time having you on the show, and we look forward to having you back again. Thank you, Adela. Thank you, Mary. Um, always fun being on set with you ladies. Um, so before we go, do ensure you follow us on Instagram, at Wayshow Africa. You can interact with us further, drop a comment, and most importantly, follow all our social media engagements. And remember to like, share, comment, and invite your friends and family to watch us and follow us. If you missed today's quote, here it is again. Recognize and embrace your uniqueness. I don't think the ratios are going to change anytime soon but I don't think it has to be a disadvantage being a black woman being a woman in general on a team of all men means that you're going to have a unique voice it's important to embrace that um, we'll see you again on Monday at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screens have a good evening